Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So in this session, we will continue from where we left off in the last class. We are basically looking at beams. We are looking at the internal forces in the beams, which are basically shear forces and bending moments. In a beam, these internal forces uh, change from section to section. So we are able to capture all the changes <coughs> in terms of graphs which we call shear force diagram and bending moment diagram. So as an analyst, if you give me that diagram, and I also look at the deflected shape, deflection diagram, which strictly is not needed if your scope is only the force response, but it's good to also draw the deflected shape, especially to correlate the sagging uh, curvature which you can see which the, with the sagging bending moment that you get in the bending moment diagram. So <clears throat> these are the fundamental relationships. We went through this. Uh, you'll find that all these derivations imply uh, continuity. Q, the load intensity, is shown here in this derivation to be continuously varying uh, along the length of the beam. You could also have uh, moments as loads. We have not shown that here. But a question may arise. Um, what happens when you have concentrated forces? Are these differential equations valid then? Now, if you look at the kinematic variables, you'll find that discontinuities are unlikely unless there's a separation. So the deflected profile will be continuous. Even if you have a moment, an internal hinge, the deflected shape will be continuous. The slope will also be continuous, typically. And the curvature will also be continuous. So here calculus can be applied clearly. It's only in the static variables the shear force uh, can, uh, sorry, the load intensity can be discontinuous. You can have a concentrated load. Of course, in reality, there's nothing called a point load. You, to practically apply a load, you have to put it over at least a small width. So it's always distributed, but over a small width. These are important implications to understand. And the shear force is continuous but you will find sometimes jumps in the shear force diagram. Are they really jumps is a question we should see. Can you have jumps in the bending moment diagram? Yes, whenever you have a concentrated moment applied, you will have a jump. So those are things to look at. So we will now look at what happens when you apply a concentrated load. It's a simple uh, cantilever. Can we still apply those equations? How will you write Q of X here? Yes? You're right. This is called a singularity. So you have to invoke some singularity function. A function that you could invoke is the direct delta function. So there's a loading diagram and your reactions are P. This part is not loaded. And you'll have a <coughs> support moment P into A, hogging moment. And this is how you can. This is for those of you who are uh, especially you have research scholars here, you will uh, need to understand the mathematics. Practicing engineers get away, they say there's no need. But just to, for completeness, you, have, you can write this as a distributed load with a concentrated load and a direct delta function. <coughs> you may have studied in maths. Delta x minus a means 
at all points other than x equal to a, the value of this function is 0. And at x equal to a, what is the value of that function? No, it's not 1. It is an impulse of undefined magnitude over a small width. But when you integrate it, that value must be equal to 1. Are you getting it? That's the definition. So uh, to understand that, so the value is 0 everywhere except exactly at x equal to a. And at x equal to a, you have a jump in the function uh, of infinite magnitude, but only in terms of intensity. In dynamics, you have the impulse function. But when you integrate it and make it into kilonewton, not kilonewton per meter, then this is the integral. Actually, in the definition, this goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. But here, the span of the beam is L. So when you integrate this with x, the value is 1, which is what we want. So everywhere, the load is 0, the load intensity is 0, except locally here. And so if I integrate all the loads on this beam, I should get p. I do get that, because that p is a constant. I can pull it out. And this integral, by definition, is equal to 1. So I get uh, p. I'm putting a minus sign, because in our fundamental equations, we assumed everything positive when it corresponds to the upward y-axis direction. Right? Delta is positive if it's going up. Delta is negative if it goes down. Similarly, all these quantities, uh, shear force also. Uh, <coughs> in load intensity also strictly minus. So as a practicing engineer, I won't bother about plus or minus. I know the direction. So I'm just showing there are two ways to look at uh, this. One is from a pure mathematical perspective, which is also important for academics, where you can't go wrong and you have to interpret. And the other from a practical point of view. So you can take both these approaches. Practicing engineers forget the mathematics after many years of practice, but uh, it's good to know both. Okay. Now, as far as shear force is concerned, it goes up, and uh, this part is unloaded. What, how can you say that the shear force here is zero? What's the argument, logic? Huh? You must give a logical argument. If I have a simply supported beam, and I put a load in the middle, there is still shear force in throughout the beam. So I can't give the argument there's no load in that region. No, the load is not there, but shear force is there. So don't give me the simple argument. Huh? No, not reaction. It should be all your internal forces you should get from. No, from what concept? What is the concept you're invoking? I told you, be very clear. Newton's third law, Newton's first law. Uh, what concept are you invoking to establish that not only the shear force, bending moment anywhere between C and B is zero? What is the concept you're invoking? What are you looking at? Yeah, but how? What are you doing? Free body. You must use the right word. You can't get to internal forces unless you expose them. How do you expose them? By cutting a free body in your mind. So if I always start from, if I cut a free body here in my mind, a small element there, then wherever I cut, strictly speaking, I should show the potentiality for a shear force and bending moment. Yes or no? So I mark it there, S and M. Then I apply equilibrium. So when you said equilibrium, you probably meant all that. But in your, you have to logically prove by moving from the known to the unknown. Your internal forces are unknown. In your free body, you can straight away put the loads. Here, there are no loads to put. But if you take a free body from this side, certainly there are loads to put. I mean, at least in the free body, the reaction is treated as a, a force. Whether it's known or unknown is left to you. Is it clear? So be clear about the principles and you must be able to prove through logic what intuitively you know to be right. So sometimes intuition can be wrong if you have a bad hunch.
clear so shear force is p in this sector and it's zero in this sector now a question comes at exactly x equal to a uh, what will you say because there you have a singularity so uh, hardcore mathematicians will contest should you put less than equal to or less than strictly speaking it's safe to say less than a it is this greater than a infinitesimally is that and exactly x equal to a u it is strictly undefined it can take any value between 0 and p strictly so be careful but we are civil engineers you know the joke hmm? <laughs> Uh, rocket scientists, if they make small errors, you may not land on the moon. <laughs> uh, similarly, you know, you know, in certain precision instruments, you can't make errors in the order of microns. But in surveying civil engineers, you know from your own practice, uh, we sometimes make errors in the order of meters, right? So at least millimeters. So. Uh, uh, that's why practicing engineers don't bre break the head over this, but strictly mathematically, you should understand the implications. All right. The bending moment, again, in this region, if you cut a free body, it's zero. It's no problem. So uh, whenever you see a free end, you start there. You're cutting your free body there. Then you won't have any problem. But if in this region, your maximum moment is there, and... Uh, um, the moment is zero here. I hope you know what to, how to calculate this. And then it's important, though not needed for drawing shear force and bending moment diagram, it's important to sketch the deflected shape, the rough deflected shape. Now, deflected shape is going to look like this. In this sector, it's going to be absolutely straight. Why? Not internal forces. One particular force is not there. See? There is no bending moment there. Because there is no bending moment there, what happens? Ah, M by I is equal to E by R. So M is equal to EI into and divided by R. So if M is 0, 1 by R must be 0. 1 by R is called? curvature that means radius of curvature must be infinite that's why it's straight you must be clear though you probably know the answer logically you must uh, be consistent okay and this is a curve but what is the polynomial that you will apply so why do I say it's a cubic function any reason Can you prove it? I mean, it's not needed. You just draw a sketch. Who cares whether it's third order, fourth order, second order, tenth order? You're just drawing a sketch. But it's uh, good to know, right? You're all, some of you are research scholars. Why is it third order? Can anyone tell me? Mm -hmm. Remember the previous slide? Remember the relationships? The order of the curvature comes from the order of the bending moment. The bending moment is varying linearly, first order. So curvature must be also first order, m by ei. Ei is constant. If curvature is first order, curvature is the derivative of slope. Slope must be second order. Slope is the derivative of deflection. So deflection must be third order. Are you getting it? Simple. Grandmother. Deflection is a grandmother. Curvature is a granddaughter. Rotation or slope is the daughter. Are you getting the relationships? That's how you do it. Good. So let's summarize uh, this simple understanding. You have a load case here. We'll put different load cases. And you have uh, response variables. These two are the internal forces. This corresponds to Q. Okay, Q is covered there. And these are the three kinematic variables. Got it? So, supposing you have a linearly varying load. Q of x is varying linearly. That includes uniform. Uniform is a special case of linear. Uh, 
if this is varying linearly, let's say it's not uniform, it's linearly varying, what is the variation of the shear force? Huh? Second order, quadratic, because this fellow is a derivative of this. What is the variation of bending moment? Third order, cubic. What is the variation of curvature? Third order, you're getting it? Because m by ei. What is the variation of slope? Fourth order. What is the variation of quartic is fourth order? Deflection? Fifth order. What's the word for it in English? Huh? Quintic. Uh, not bad. Good. Quintic. Right. So what happens if it is uniform? This is a special case of this. But this simplifies. What does this become? Shear force. Huh? First order. Linear. Now, if this is a special case of this, is this a special case of this? Is first order a special case of second order? Yes, yes second order is a generic equation. What's the, how will you write the polynomial function? A x squared plus B x plus C. How does it become first order? A is 0. So you understand, always higher order is you're better off, you are including all the lower orders by suitable choice of the constants. But I'm saying this because you must have a clean understanding of what's going on. If you've done PhD, we assume you know what is taught at M-Tech level and B-Tech level and high school and all that, right? But that's not true often because our learning, you understand. But here, mathematically, you can't go wrong. Okay. So, what is the bending moment going to be varying in? Second order. And curvature? Second order. And slope? Third order. And deflection? Fourth order. Right? You know the game. Last one, concentrated load. We write capital Q or W or P or whatever you like. Units of this is kilonewton, this is kilonewton per meter, kilonewton per meter. Got it? What will be the shear force variation? Huh? Uniform. Okay? Constant. What will be the variation of any moment? Linear. This is a special case of this. Is this a special case of the cubic? Of course it is. Lydia, M by EI. Quadratic, cubic. Are you getting it? That's it. So, if you've learned how to do this, certainly you can do this, but this mathematically, if you can include the direct delta function, you can do that also. Clear? Yeah. Can you speak? We have a... Uh, Slope is not okay, 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 okay. So he is given. Let me draw. So it's not enough to draw pictures. You must check whether they work or not. He drew a picture like this. And tell me if I'm drawn it correctly. Pin joint here. Pin joint here. And a hinge here. Right? Internal hinge there. Right? Now, before we get into mathematics, will this system work? So, you must begin with stability before you get into all this. Will this system work? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Will it take loads? Yes. <laughs> okay, before that, let's understand what happens. What is the difference between this? which we are familiar with and this and beginners get confused I'll apply a load here what's the difference between these two? let's say this bang in the middle this is W this is L by 2 L by 2 so the reaction here is W by 2, W by 2. What about the reactions here? Same. So most practicing engineers, 
would treat them the same, but is there a difference? What's the shear force diagram like? Goes up W by 2, remains constant, takes a plunge W by 2, goes up, right? SFT, positive, negative, W by 2. What's the bending moment diagram going to change like? This is sagging and this value will be W by 2 into L by 2, standard formula W L by 4. Simple question. This which we know is valid for a simply supported beam, is it equally valid for a beam which has a hinge support on both sides? What's the difference? In fact, if you go to your computer and use software, you'll get the same answer. But there is a catch here. What's a catch? Right. So you have to understand that this is strictly statically indeterminate. And you here horizontal reaction is not possible because here it's not possible. So what is the reaction going to be? Is it going to be outward or inward? At least you must guess that. Is the reaction going to point to the left or to the right? So to understand all this, in your mind, that's why I'm saying the right brain is dead, not used. You must draw the deflected shapes. Okay? That was the a problem with your question. You drew it, but you're not thinking whether it will work or not. You have to draw the deflected shape. Draw the deflected shape of this. Well, we'll simply draw something like this, right? But if you're very accurate, this is likely to roll in a little, little bit. Less than a millimeter in practice, but it can roll. But if you draw this one, You'll be drawing so that it comes back exactly there, right? No movement, this movement is not allowed. As a result, this deflection will be more or this deflection will be more? A or B? A will be more, right? So this deflection will be less strictly if you call this delta. 1, delta 2 must be necessarily less than delta 1. If you've taken the centroidal axis and drew this line, that centroidal axis will be a neutral axis here. But here it won't be neutral because there will be a tensile, tensile force acting here whose magnitude you don't know. So it is statically indeterminate. And the indeterminacy, the only unknown is the horizontal force. But in beams, you don't really bother about actual forces. Because now it's become a frame member. The moment you have an actual force, it's not a pure beam element, it's a frame element. Right? And incidentally, if I want to find H, how will I find out? You already know the method of consistent deformation, for example. How will I find out? Please note, H does not change this in first order structural analysis. H does not affect this at all. That's why we normally ignore it. But it is there. How do you find out this unknown force? I like these questions because it throws open uh, new areas which are normally not covered in basic course. It's covered in the textbook. You can go through that. <laughs> All right. It, just tell me how to, just give me a method how to calculate H. I start with the configuration. No, no. All the configurations are drawn here. What should I do? Well, this is what you should do. You treat this H as your redundant, which means this, I can say, is equal to this, plus I take the same beam, 
same simply supported beam and I put the redundant there. Here what do I do? I, I want to apply this H as an as a external force H so that I'm going to actually drag it so that I get back let me call this uh, delta, small delta, this delta, which is easy to calculate. What is this delta formula? Tell me. Delta is HL by EA. You know this. This is easy. This delta is not so easy to calculate, but it's possible. We'll see this later because you have to take the curved length minus the straight length there's a way to do it, we'll get into Why don't you check it out? But at least I want you to know that there is going to be some actual tension. And that actual tension is beneficial in the sense the deflection is less. Now, if you're doing, so, so this is normally ignored, but unless you're doing second order stru structural analysis, which means you are looking at geometric nonlinearity, mm -hmm. then if you take a free body because this has no deflection so strictly speaking you can't superimpose this deflection with this deflection and get this deflection you understand not in first order first order will get you a reasonably good value of h but you really have to do second order analysis in second order analysis we take care of what's called p delta effect which means I have to look at equilibrium. Let's take this free body. I have to take the equilibrium in the deformed configuration. Which means here I have in if I'm taking equilibrium in this configuration, which is normally not done in first order, then I have a force here my shear force may be zero if I'm bang close to that, but let's say I have a shear force. Somewhere to the left of this, I have a shear force, which is W by two. And I have a moment, let's say this L by two. So this is W by two, this is whatever H is. H is a function of the actual stiffness and the flexural stiffness. You need to get into that. but in this deformed configuration, I have a, a moment. Is it going to be a sagging moment? Normally, yes, WL by 4, the moment that you get here. But this actual tension in the deformed configuration will give me a P delta effect, right? So if I cut a free body here, will that be sagging or hogging? Will it be sagging or hogging? Well, do, if I cut a free body here and I've got something like this, obviously this will do that, so I have to do this. So this hogging, that's how in your mind you should think. So this is beneficial, it reduces my bending moment by a quantity which is exactly H into delta 2 right this is called the p delta moment so it's beneficial in reducing my moment but then i have my, to take care of my edge is it clear in this there's no edge so the, it it won't affect so these are uh, subtle things which you raise but coming back to his question um, will this work it looks okay nice mm -hmm. but if i apply a load here is this a truss? So we'll answer this question. So will this work or not? Intuitively tell me. And we will explore this in the next topic when we do trusses. For it to work, this cannot be perfectly horizontal. You have to have a slight inclination. Either way, you can. if you have this, it'll work. If you have this, will it work? You have two options. Huh? This will work, this won't work. 
unless it's significantly high. This won't work, this won't work, this will work. This I'm saying very small. Why? Why won't it work? Give me a correct answer. No, don't complicate things. So he's talking of snap through buckling and all. But then you've lost the shape. Are, I want my house to look like this. It snaps through and start looking like that. Uh, it's not a good thing for it to happen. Okay, so we'll look into that later. Okay. So we'll move on. Now let's use this understanding and uh, do some guesswork. I have two cantilever beams, one with the linear variation in this direction, maximum here and zero here, the other in this direction. Support is here, fixed support is there, right? I want to learn to draw correctly the shear force diagram and bending moment diagram. The total load is how much? Q0 del by 2, triangle. And I can write the equation for Q of X mathematically like this. Similar triangles at X, it's uh, scaled by Q0 into X by L. And here, 1 minus X by L. Got it? With a minus sign. This is if you're interested mathematically. I'm more interested in the practicing thing because I want you to get a feel for it. It's because the practicing was weak that you asked that question. Practicing engineers don't ask that question because they know it won't work. So it's good. Now, this is a linear variation. Now, let me draw the shear force diagram. I know the relationship. The shear force is the father or the son of load intensity. What is this you are mistaking? Which is a derivative? Which is a derivative? Which is the derivative? Is shear force a derivative or load intensity? Load intensity is a derivative. Right? Q is derived from S. Though actually Q is known and S is unknown. Uh, the, the relationships are like that. So, are you f so what is... In that, in our analogy, shear force is father or son? Father, right? All right, now you have to draw the father's distribution. I am going to draw true. Is this okay? Because the support reaction will be W. And because it's linear, I know this is going to be quadratic. That much I know from the last slide. Is this okay? Or is this okay? <laughs> See, look at this. You said yes. One look and you said yes. But both are quadratic. First one or second one? First one is correct for this. And second one is correct for? For this. Why? Good, good. Huh? Yeah, so you go by your understanding of slope. The slope of your shear force diagram is zeros. That means the magnitude of Q must be zero. Correct. The slope here is maximum. And your magnitude is maximum. I mean, compared to the rest of it, it's ma maximum. Got it? That's the only check you have to do. Whereas here you see the... A slope is maximum at the support and it is and the value of the slope is Q0 and the slope is 0 here and the value of Q0 Q is 0 there. Are you getting it? That's how you think. So left brain is needed here. Left brain also. So you get clean bold. Both of them you don't know which is which but you must know and very easy. The checks are very easy. All right. And you can always derive equations. Hmm? Either you work out mathematically or direct. What about bending moment? Which will have more bending moment? If you are designing these two beams, which one will need a heavier section? Left one or right one? Left one. Why? Shear force, is it same for both? Maximum shear force? Yes, because total load will go cantilever, no? Shear force is the same, but bending moment 
Position of Lord. Position of Lord. The Lord is having a larger lever arm and inducing a higher bending moment. So bending moment, you know that this is having a bending moment, which is two times the bending moment here. Because your CG of the load is acting at 2L by 3, here it's acting at L by 3 only. So you can easily work out. Clear? What about deflections? Deflections will be more in this, in the free end, you know, maximum deflection is at the free end. Now, mathematicians don't like the word maximum when you use it for a cantilever. Why? Hardcore mathematician. Because in their mind, they are always playing with maxima and minima. If your deflection is maximum, the, the derivative of it should be zero. But here the slope is also maximum there. <laughs> deflection is maximum, slope is maximum. So what's, uh, how to speak in a language which are not objected to by hardcore mathematicians. You say largest value, they have no problem with that. So they, you understand, it's the largest value but we are crude engineers, especially civil engineers. So we say maximum, but actually it's strictly it should be largest value. All right, so uh, if you go by the argument that this moment is cubic, so curvature is cubic, then deflection will be fifth order, quintic. Then the quintic can be drawn in two ways. C can be drawn like this. This gives you a larger magnitude. So this only your better understanding will be able to help you draw this. So don't say both are fifth order, but they don't give magnitudes. They give only the order of the curve. But here deflection will be more. You know that you're going to, you're, the closer you come to the end, the more the deflection is, the more the bending moment is. Getting it? So left brain, right brain, both should work. Clear? Good. Okay, if you want, you can use a conjugate beam and work out the deflections. So you'll get these. We'll study conjugate beam in uh, part three. And you can also actually work out the values very quickly. Okay, now I'm going to show you, now you be practicing engineers. Always you should ask a question. What's the load? Old and engineers, old day engineers, you should ask how many tons? 10 tons, 100 kilonewton, which today we say 100 kilonewton. So let's say the total load is W. In our mind, the reference is what kind of loading? All of us know it. Yeah, so one formula for bending moment we know by heart. What is it? Unfortunately, you have learnt all the wrong way. You say WL squared by 8, but there in your mind you have a small W. I am interested in total load, yeah. If I ask you your weight, will you give in kilonewton per meter? Then I have to get your height and all that. No, no. You will give me in kilonewton. Total load is total load. So what should be the formula? From now on, don't say WL squared by 8. Say capital WL by 8. Clear? Total load, moment, kilonewton meter. Clear? At the mid span. So that's in our mind, we are clear that usually UDL, WL by 8 is a formula. What can you guess what will be the moment at the mid span here? First of all, is the moment maximum at the mid span? Generally, always yes. It's symmetric. All these beams are symmetric. What's the moment? Can you guess the formula? WL by? Will it be more than WL by 8 or less than WL by 8? Less. less. Why? Because it's not concentrated. Uh, you know, this region has no load, it's like removing a triangle there and it's more concentrated near the supports. You put, let's say all the loads are at the support, moment will be zero in the middle. So it will be less. Can you guess the number? You can calculate. WL by how much? WL by 12. 16 was too low. So don't go too low. Uh, Einstein once said, and it's the, that quote is there in my book. Everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. You are oversimplifying, you'll, your building might collapse. All right, good, WL by 12. This, we know the answer, WL by 8. I'm not asking you the order of the curve. We are beyond that. We are practicing and we don't care what the order. Some curve is there, distributed, right? 
what happens if you divide this load and put it as that's what we do in the lab remember lab we can't put uniformly distributed so we have a tree arrangement and we put concentrated loads right so this entire load I divide into five parts what do you think the moment will be it will be close to WL by 8 will it be more than WL by 8 well it is more WL by 6.67 so don't jump in always do some calculation ok you said confidently no you can't make such judgments right let's take this loading three loads will it be more than WL by definitely yes because you have a concentration here will it be more than this yes how much do you think it will be WL by now yes calculate in your mind you can calculate WL by 6 is increasing we will draw one more triangular load where will you get this triangular load I mean you can draw any load but in practice where is this triangular load coming trust no no in slab in this room supposing there is a beam here supposing and you have a one way slab here can you see this above there is a false ceiling but above that one way slab then you know that in this region more or less you will get a triangular distribution of load so don't think triangle should be always vertical it can come in any way there is a more stronger intensity of load in the middle region so these are practical problems is it clear you, if you do it as a UDL you are making a error not in shear force because you w, it's everywhere the maximum shear is still W by 2 but you are making an error in moment so how much do you think it will be well it's WL by 6 same as this but the shape this is piecewise linear this is smooth and lastly if you have a concentrated if the entire load is concentrated and put bang in the middle what do you think the moment will be you know the answer WL by 4 so this is half of this moment this is one third of this moment so as a practicing engineer you should know how much load is coming what are the implications of it in terms of shear force and bending moment you have a quick feel you may make mistakes but these are the checks that you should have many people don't have any such checks and they blindly use software the future is all software <coughs> everything is automated and you might get ridiculous values because someone forgot to check the total weight total load applied on your structure simple error we make is we didn't read properly instead of applying as kilo newton we applied as kilo newton per meter finished you uh, get five times uh, the load everything is get scaled up no checks no feel and also you must have a physical feel we know our own weight similarly when you talk of height we always talk in terms of how many stories because in our mind three stories three meter is one story height so get a feel are you understanding that kind of feel an engineer should always have ok good now let's do let's find out the let's analyze this beam you can analyze it anyway I told you the one way is the way a beginner does by using all mathematics you can do that total load is always get the total load first no confusion total load units is kilonewton this is a linearly distributed load C can you guess what the moment of this will be you saw the pictures started with WL by 12 all the way to WL by 4 WL by 9 yes. ok we will check, check you out WL by 9 he says fine we will see well first of all you get the reaction in your mind you say that the centroid of the load is here and two thirds of this will come here one third will come there straight away and you can convert it in terms of Q0 as a practicing engineer W is what matters 
as a academic q naught is important but you have to have you have to have both abilities all right you got this then you have to write an expression for q now strictly speaking you should put a minus but if you are practicing engineers you can throw away the minus similar triangles if this is q naught this will be q naught to x by l so if you take a free body let's do the practicing engineers way because we've we are done with the academic way. Take a section here. You must draw this. This Q is Q naught X by L. You've already done that. Then you have to put two arrow marks there. The two internal forces. One shear force, will it be downward or upward? Our sign convention. Downward positive. And moment will be anti-clockwise or clockwise? Sagging positive. So in your mind, you should draw. Well, first, you get the total load in this small triangle. We'll put a capital Q. Capital Q will be sm small q, half q x, which you can expand and write like this. And then you put these two, S of x positive downward, M of x moment sagging positive. Is it clear? Now on this free body, you can just apply equilibrium and say sigma f y equal to 0. So this fellow must be equal to this minus this. So simple. V A minus Q. And this moment will be this into this distance minus Q into X by 3. That's all. That's how you should think. And if students give solutions, you must reward their thinking process. And not look for the final answer and say, no, everything is wrong. No. Final answer may be correct because the fellow copied from the neighbor. But this thinking process is very important. So you see how easy it is. Practicing engineers do it on the back of the envelope. Quick calculation. Then you can write it nicely in this format. Once you've got these equations, uh, a good engineer will draw the diagram to get a feel. You must be able to draw your shear force diagram and bending moment diagram. What do they look like? Well, shear force here will be W by 3 here will be 2w by 3 and the signs you should know. So you start here, you go up by this quantity and then you know that this is a linear variation. So this must be a second order variation. And you know that the slope should have a zero slope here because the magnitude of the intensity is zero there. Are you getting the clue? You start like that and then you know you must come back here and somewhere it's going to cross the line. Right? What's that point where it crosses the line? It's very important. This location is very important, x bar. Why? Why? Point of contraflexion. All confusion. Is this entirely sagging or partly sagging hogging? That which left brain is saying or right brain is saying? Right brain says, look, it's all sagging. I don't have any hogging. It's a simply support beam with a downward load on top. It is going to sag. Where the hell do you have a point of contraflexure? You have no points of contraflexure. It is completely sagging. So, your, where the shear force is zero, something is maximum or minimum. What is that? Bending, Bending moment. Right? So, that's why you... Practicing engineers, don't tell me what is the maximum moment because my girder size... ISMB 300, 400, he is waiting to pick it, pick up the girder size. He doesn't care about, he says absolute maximum, what's the moment? So you must get that. Or you should guess intelligently. You said WL by 9, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Can I say that C point as a pure point? What is the dimension of a point? So, it is uh, the land, in a land of total impurity, at an infinitesimally small point, can you get any purity? <laughs> you understand? Even you can't put your foot on that point. Well, the point has, delta x tends to zero. Most of your foot will be impure. So, you can say anything you want. We'll come to that point. Point versus reality. So don't say such things. Pure bending must have sufficient distance for... Remember the four-point loading test? 
If you keep those two nodes very close to each other, you don't have pure bending. You must have some region where the shear force is zero. Some region. Here there is no region. It's just one point. So I would not use the word pure bending. But since you raise this point issue, let me ask you a question. How will you define stress at a point? What's the definition of stress from your understanding? Uh, don't give me blah blah. I want mathematics. How to calculate? Force per area. Force per area. Yeah, you keep quiet. We've discussed in our class. <laughs> what is the area of a point? Zero. Purely equal to zero. Right? Then how will you define stress when the denominator is zero? Only he will answer. So stress at a point cannot be defined. I am saying all this because you brought in the point about the point. <laughs> I am using that point to poke you. <laughs> so this is a common un misunderstanding and in all interviews all students are floored. They, for the first time in their life they are thinking that's true is it or denominator goes to zero then the, it's undefined isn't it? So let me answer this. First of all, stress is something internal. So if you have a solid body and you are interested in knowing the stress at a point inside the body, you have to cut a section passing through that point. Uh, which direction? Any direction you like. So we will choose one direction like that and you got an area and it's subject to a lot of forces. Then you take either the left free body or the right free body and then you will get in that area which includes the point, you have got a resultant force. P and a large area A but the stresses may be non-uniformly distributed all over the place. So a rough value of the stress in that large area is P by A. We have a lot of internal conflict in the country, you know. But some regions have more conflict than other regions. Some regions are relatively peaceful, right? Some institutions have more conflict than other in some institutions, nothing is going on. Others, people are going on strike all the time. So, average is a dangerous thing. You are missing the point. I said, what's the stress at that particular point? So, you have to narrow the area. So, when you narrow the area, what happens? And I take a free body with that area. What happens is, the denominator reduces to a small value, but the resultant force acting on that area will also reduce delta P by delta A and the direction will also change. But when you take it to the limit and this has been established well, it's called the Cauchy limit, C-A-U-C-H-Y, you will find it will converge to a, both are reducing, it will converge to a finite value and that is the stress and the component of that stress normal to the plane is called normal stress and the component of that stress tangential to that plane is called shear stress. So you should know. So there are lots to know about points. Okay, good. Uh, so you get, now my job is I've got maximum shear force. See maximum minimum, the sign is not important in shear force. I just want and you can always go to the support reaction because that's where everything is maximum. The largest values are there. So you said, my, I need the web to take this shear force, this reaction. Now I need, in this region, this moment. I want to know how much is that moment? Is it more than WL by 8 or less than WL by 8? My, my first reference is WL by 8. Because I, if I knew, then I wouldn't even do any structural analysis. Let's put WL by 8. So let's do it properly. So M max occurs at some distance where the shear force is actually zero, right? And so I take a free body, I take a free body here and I can prove that it's at x by L equal to 1 by root 3 which is roughly near the middle but little on this side. Obviously it has to be slightly beyond the halfway mark because the load is increasing only gradually, right? So at about 0.58 times the length, 
that's where this is once I know that I can go to my moment equation so all I did was equate this to 0 and got x bar and I plug in that value and get m and get m and then m I get some fun my calculator can give me as many decimal places as I like but as a practicing engineer I, I just want to know wl by how much are you getting it and if you convert it it's wl by 7.79 .7 so it's not wl by 9 it's not w it's slightly less than w but if you are designed for wl by 8 structure will still be okay are you getting it but you have to do some calculations we had a talk the other day by a experienced practicing engineer and he said everything is going to be automated from now on you don't need any design engineers it's all artificial intelligence it's all once you feed the data everything is designed then what's the job of the designer designer has to check how well one check is you do the same thing in another software that those are all big checks which for important structures you have to do but you have to use your hunch no 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 this member I want this size looks small let me check it out so you need the WL by 8 kind of calculations are you, you understand that's how you get a feel okay move on I gave you this problem remember when we try to find the reactions now we want to find the internal force also. so let's go through the reaction calculation once more how a practicing engineer will do it he will not write sigma m a equal to zero that's all children will do that grown-up people don't do they just look okay 30 kilo newton how much goes here how much goes here tell me how much goes here remember b by l so 6 by 8 of 30 will go here right that's how he does it and the rest goes there how much of this 40 see this udl you can convert to a constant load it makes no difference for reaction calculation but it makes a difference when you when will it make a difference where only when you are looking at internal forces in this sector it's important to preserve the distribution otherwise you can replace it with this in this region it doesn't matter you can replace it no problem only when you cut a section here you have to be careful so 40 kilo newton how much will go here how much will go there here it's 2 by 8 and 6 by 8 10 30 then you have one more load on the overhang 20 uh, see whenever you walk in a construction site and they put all kinds of planks there be careful when you are stepping over on an overhang why the whole thing might come over because there is an uplift here so you the contractor should have put enough nails there so that it doesn't overturn are you getting it so here itself we get a feeling you know the old lever principle when you are looking at this don't look at these these are all gone so if this is acting down the reaction here must also be down and the lever principle 20, if you take moments about this point 20 into 2 is this downward reaction into 8 so the reaction there is minus 20 into 2 by 8 that's how an engineer does it clear and here it's a rest but don't forget from this side you get the full 20 newton. so this is 25 that's how equilibrium is satisfied 25 minus 5 is 20 always have this equilibrium check you won't go wrong so practicing engineers are sure at every step you're, you're, you're going right and final check is if you add all this and you add all this it must add up to the total load got it now we go to internal forces I want to know the complete shear force diagram and bending moment diagram I am now going to draw the shear force diagram without a single calculation like you get in answer sheets no integration no differential nothing just by using direct equilibrium how do I do that first I draw a baseline and I don't want to keep writing kilometer and kilometer and everywhere I have a you know boss who insists he always asks is it oranges or mangoes so I say you I'll just put numbers here you I put kilonewton it's applicable to all of them okay so where do I start 
anyway let me start here so this is pointing up so I go up by how much 27.5 then in my mind I'm cutting free but nothing is happening here so it will remain flat at 27 this is how you draw shear force diagrams then it takes a plunge because the moment I cut a section here it's going to go down 30 and 30 is more than 27.5 so it's going to go below the baseline it's going to change sign that's what you get 2.5 then it remains constant in this sector so it remains flat have you learnt to draw shear force diagram like this that's the best way to do it practicing engineers do it all the time then what happens tell me will it go up or will it go down Are, it's all going down load is going to take it down so and it's going will it be a jump no it's going to be a gradual slope and you have to just know what's the value here it's going to go down by 40 kilonewton steadily here so what will be the value here will it be 62.5 no it will be 2.5 plus 40 so it go like that 42.5 then what happens in the free body remove the supports it takes a jump of 62.5 so it crosses the line again and then if you cut a free body here it remains straight and then it does it make sense so easy really easy this is how you learn to draw shear force diagram next is bending moment diagram so straight away you say I'm going to do it kilonewton meter in your mind these supports have gone you're looking at free body you have 27.5 into 2 sagging moment of 55 then you want to know the moment at C and it's going to be straight because the slope of that see the slope of this is constant the next slope will also be constant what is the value that you get at C you are going to add something no how much is that so you work it out it it comes down to 50 actually because it is 27.5 into 4 minus 30 into 2 you get 50 then what's going to happen well we can start from here and say this part is a cantilever it's an overhang I know what to do that's going to be 40 and it's hogging so here you can have a point of contraflexion are you getting it so you will get a point so this is 40 now between C and D how should I join this this is straight this is straight line uniform this is linear so this will be parabola uh, there are many ways I can draw parabola. Let me draw one parabola. Is that okay? First of all, parabola should look like a parabola. And secondly, I don't know whether I'm going to get a value higher than 50 or then this may be wrong. But intuition, slowly you'll learn it. This is a better parabola. Hmm? And once you're pretty sure about this, that's it. This is how, and, and you, it's, everything should be roughly to scale. If this is 55, this should look 50, and this should look 40. Clear? That's it. Now, it shouldn't stop here. Normally, it stops here. You should also draw the deflected shape. And now, your point of contraflexion is close to the support. So, roughly, it will look like that. You see, this region is hugging up to this point and this entire region is sagging and this is a point of contribution this has got all these kinks but this guy is a smooth movement is it clear this skill you have to master okay now we'll come to the point shear force diagram so when will the bending moment be maximum when the shear force Changes sign or when the shear force is zero? Changes. Mathematics say zero. It has to be zero. But you are saying changing sign. Practicing engineers with a lot of experience say it's zero. So we have to understand in practice what's happening. So theoretically, we do this, but practically you'll never have a constant load because there's nothing called pure point load. They're all impure. 
at least over 1 millimeter you have to put, actually it will be 10 millimeters. So, over a small region the same W is active. So, this is imagination, this is reality. And let's see, reality versus idealization, what changes it will make. Shear force diagram is going to change like this, you got a sudden jump. What is the shear force at C? Someone asks, gate exam question. What is the shear force at C? What is the answer? What is the answer? SC is equal to multiple choice question. Plus W by 2 or minus W by 2? So I will give you many options. Plus W by 2, minus W by 2, 0, plus W by 4, minus W by 4. I can give you infinite numbers in the range plus W by 4 to minus W. Yes or no? All are correct. Because because it's not defined, it's a jump. Any value here is okay between this and this. But, and that's why you say that when the shear force changes sign, okay. But in reality, if you draw the shear force diagram, and the bending moment diagram will be a sharp point WL by 4. We know this. This is what we do. In the exam, you draw this. But in your mind, you laugh and say, this is not practical, this is it. And what's your shear force diagram going to look like? Can you draw it? It's going to look like this. Ah, look at that. Over this small region, there's a tilt. It is W by 2 till this point. And it is minus W by 2 till this point. In this region, there's a jump. It's not a sharp vertical drop. It has a slight tilt. And so what is the real value of SC? The correct answer, in practice, it is zero. No doubt. It is zero. Actually, you should write zero kilonewton in reality. Does it make sense? So this is real life. And what about your bending moment diagram? Will it be the same? Practicing and there, TK are same. But if you are a strict teacher, say, you look for a little change there also. This will be a little curved. This will be beveled. In this region, there will be a little parabola. Little! Somebody standing here between the two feet, and small thing. Why do you say oh, it's not so important? Is it clear? Oh, we learnt many things today in reality. Okay. Now let's do this. We are coming to the end. Try this problem. I now have a concentrated moment. How do I apply concentrated moment? Let's say I have a rigid link there and I apply something here and something there. My first suggestion to you is can you draw the deflected shape of this? Draw. For this loading, what will be the deflected shape? I'm going to ask you three questions, so I'm going to draw three. What will be the deflected shape? What is the deflection at the middle? Zero. zero. Why do you say it's zero? Give me an argument to say it is zero. Huh? I am applying two loads which is having coupled. So one part I am left foot I am pushing up and I don't move pushing down. No, no, I, I don't understand. I want a powerful argument where even my grandmother will say yes, it is zero. All the laugh up and down, she won't understand. Yeah. No, she doesn't understand moment. She is a grandmother first of all. And her, she can see. She is not yet blind. And she doesn't want to use the left brain. Most of us are like that only. You're pretending we are B.Tech from IIT. And no. Yeah? no, 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 no. 
the beam will deflect other than in the middle, no? At the middle we are saying it's zero, why? In fact, I, I'll draw the picture. The way it's going to happen, I feel it's going to happen like that. The point of contraflection. Yes or no? We know it. She says this. Now, supposing I put, instead of clockwise moment, I put anti-clockwise moment. Same thing will get flipped over. We don't have any problem in that. Yes or no? Agreed? We can draw that picture. Now, let's say we are actually doing an experiment. We take a beam here, apply this. For you, it is clockwise or anti-clockwise? For me, it's clockwise. And we take measurement there. It should match, no? If you say it's going down, for me also it should go down. It cannot go up. So both of us will have to agree that it has, for both of us to agree, it cannot move. What is this argument called? The law of, it's called the law of parity. It's very useful. We'll see it's many applications later. Law of parity. That's why the deflection there is zero, right? Now, can you calculate the reactions? 18 divided by 6. This will come down, this will go up, right? To equilibrate. Agreed? Draw the shear force diagram. Will it be constant? Yes. It will go down 3, remain constant. Because this moment is a moment, it's not a, uh, it's not a force. Agreed? And can you draw the bending moment diagram? Bending moment diagram will take a kink there. So it's, look at this picture, it's hogging there. 3 into, so bending moment diagram will, 3 into 3 goes to 9. And then there's a jump there, 18, and then back to 0. This part is hogging, can you see the left part hogging? This part is sagging. Agreed? It's as though, 9 kilonewton meters applied here, it's a simply support beam and another 9 is applied here. Alright. Now we'll go to the bending moment diagram is done. Deflected diagram is over. Now we'll change the problem. Let's replace that 18 kilonewton with 3 6 kilonewton meter loads. Will the shear force diagram change? No. Try drawing the bending moment diagram. Try. Shear force diagram won't change. Bending moment diagram will change. What will it change to? Well, there will be three jumps now. There will be a jump here, jump here, small jump. Not a big jump, 18. 6, 6, 6 jump. So, this part will be same. So, it will go like that. It's anti-symmetric. It will follow this path till 4.5, then it will plunge 6, then 4.5, then 6, then go up 4.5, then 6. I mean, yeah, that's it. Are you getting it? So, it can be derived from, can you draw the deflected shape? <laughs> Someone come to the board and draw the deflected shape. Some bold structural engineer in this group. Anyone? No one? Ah, come. Brave soul. The second figure. This one. You have to draw it here. Yeah, I don't know. I've drawn this. You draw it on top here. I drew it for you. Red color. Just draw. First question, just because in the first case there was no deflection under the load, are you insisting that here also deflection should be zero? That argument need not work. Agreed? You can have a, a point of contraflexure, but it can still deflect. Now, mark the load points. There are three load points. Mark them here. Where are they? Mark 
Do you think this is correct? Yes or no? Why? Then you come and draw. Okay, thanks. It's a good attempt, not bad. Because it's... Uh, but you see what's happening. Between these two points, you are having sagging. But that's not happening here. See, in this region, you have hogging. But in this region, you have little bit of sagging and little bit of hogging. It's not showing here. This entire stretch is sagging. You want to try or you want... Now, I made it more confusing. If you want to try, try. You draw in the third figure. Last chance. But you see how important it is to uh, fire both the left brain and the right brain. Well, here you got clean, you have point of, this is hogging, here, here, take this. This is hogging, this is sagging, hogging, sagging, all alternating nicely like a sine wave. No, that's not happening there. These are simple tests of your understanding. But the real challenge is coming only. Mm. See, this is he satisfying our requirements? Yes, yes or no? Okay, and it, this may be uh, touching the baseline, may not be, we are not sure. But at the center, definitely, the deflection is zero. There, it pretty good, good. So, we leave it there, we won't break our heads over it. But the next question is coming. The next question is this. Now, if you convert this, we put many points. Uniformly distributed moment. Right? Here we divided that 18 into 3 locations. Let's put infinite locations. Right? And if you integrate 3 kilonewton meter per meter into 6 meters, we'll still give you the good old 18 kilonewton meter. Right? Draw your shear force diagram. Will it change? No, because your reactions will still be 3 and 3. Your shear force doesn't change. What about the bending moment diagram? Draw the bending moment diagram. Carefully. So, if you cut any section here, calculate the bending moment at any section m of x. 3 into x minus 3x. There is no leave, right? Which is zero, zero bending moment. Then what happens to your deflected shape? Deflected, it won't deflect. Why? Because always where you apply this, the left wants to go up, right wants to come down. Left, but you are doing it so close that the beam is confused. So okay, I won't move. So it'll remain horizontal. Now the challenge is this. Okay, this is fine. Right brain has worked well. Everything is fine. Now I'm challenged. Yeah. Oh, it is there. For example, if you have, we've seen a multi-storied building. There was a tall building in Pune that uh, we had. We had, uh, it was braced and you had cantilevers with heavy balconies. And those balconies, if you take this as a line element, uh, were Every balcony was giving a, a moment to the system. So these things, if you, these things are possible. Good question. Huh? See, let's say I have a tall tower like this. And I have at every floor something sticking out. With a concentrated load at the edge of the cantilever. Then effectively I am putting a moment at every story level. Yes or no? Right? And if this is not allowed to move, maybe it's tied. Then it's like, a, you know, if I put it like this, I'm getting this same picture. It's possible. Actually, that's where we got this problem, from a practical problem. But the more interesting thing was, 
Okay, deflections you've drawn. The more interesting thing was, here the slope of this was 3. Whether it was this case or this case, steadily 3, 3, 3. Here, how can you have a zero bending moment diagram and a slope which is finite 3? That means, whoever invented this formula made a mistake? You know the answer. We've done this in class. Huh? You know it, yeah. Others? It's a challenge, open challenge. What's the answer? Uh, this is uh, defined only for systems where uh, the moment doesn't change significantly across the small uh, DS element. So in that we cut the thing and we take the moment. Effect. Very good. Okay. So, <laughs> she's smiling. You discussed this? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, you, oh, you attended this uh, course earlier. Okay, the answer is correct. If you go to the derivation of this, remember, in this derivation, typically all textbooks, they don't give you this loading case. This is a rare loading case. So you have to go back to your fundamentals, check whether something is wrong with this derivation. It is. Let's introduce a uniform moment there, M. Now, as far as your sigma Fy is concerned, no change. This equation will still hold good. But if you take moments about this point, then whatever you did earlier, we'll have an additional component of m. So m into dx will be the additional component. When you apply this equation, you'll find that, of course, small terms you can ignore, you'll find that this equation slightly changes. S equal to dm by dx minus of m, if m is applied clockwise. So this was missing in this equation. You have to know. Everything has a logical explanation. Now if you substitute m is 0, dm by dx must be 0 because there is no variation. And so it is 0 minus small m. Small m is 3. So the answer is minus 3. Back to so here is a beautiful case where you have zero bending moment but a finite shear force and it fits very well with the correct equation. A tricky question. But then uh, you will enjoy the subject when you learn like this. We'll go, we'll take time, five more minutes. Now I'm giving you a, what is this in cricket, what is it? Reverse swing, reverse swing. <laughs> Usually, you are given the loading diagram and you have to find shear force diagram bending moment. I am giving you ulta. I am giving you bending moment diagram. This is the bending moment diagram. And I want you to draw the loading diagram and the deflection shape. This loading diagram, you can guess. What is the guess? Point load in a simply supported beam. Okay, but if you want to do it correctly, this is defined, the equation is defined and then with this definition, in this region, take one half because it's symmetric, you can take the derivative, find the shear force, the shear is constant in this half and the loading is zero and so for the other side you do the similar calculation, this is a hard way of doing it but your guess was correct, so you can draw a free body with this understanding and your free body from the free body you can get your shear force diagram right clear then you got your bending moment diagram and so this free body diagram matches with this and this is your bending moment diagram and, uh, and this is your bending moment diagram. and you guess correctly because you've seen this many times familiarity everything fits in well you started here went here went here and went here now draw the deflected shape, you can draw the deflected shape. The next question is, I am saying I am fed up with simply supported beams. Did I tell you simply supported beam when I gave you this? I want it for a cantilever beam. Simply supported beam, any, anybody can draw, because it is so familiar, but cantilever beam can you tell me how to apply the loads. Draw, right? Fixed at A, free at B. 
this pending mount my god this pending mount diagram how is it possible cantilevers don't have such pending mount diagrams So we are ending the bending of beams on a high note. And we see that in the first few classes the hall was full. When the juicy things are coming, it's only half full. Yeah. Try. And I have given you enough practice and training about understanding loading diagram, free body diagram. So much of background we have given you. Uh, you know, you attended my course, you know. Is this a good, is it a pure your structural analysis problem? Of course it is. It's a solid problem. It's practical. Yeah. Stuck. You just copied this diagram. I want to see loading diagram. Okay. There's no time, so I'll, I'll tell you. It's a powerful argument. Look. From this, we got this. At the end of the day, you got this. Whether it's cantilever or beam with overhang, this this is a free body diagram. You freed it from the supports. Ah, you, I'll take any statically determinate system. By the way, the deflected shape is like this. So I'll have a cantilever like this. So whatever P I got here, I put here. Whatever I got here, I'll put here. What's your problem? <laughs> and then what reaction will I get here? I'll get whatever I got there. But you will say, won't it have a moment? You know, there is no moment in this free body, so that must be zero. So, so are you getting it? See the power of it. The free body diagram is frozen once you got this diagram. Now you can apply any kinematic conditions which you like. In a simply supported beam, you chose this to be a reaction, this to be a reaction, this to be a load. Did anyone insist on that? No, that's up to you. Here I'm choosing this to be a load, this to be also a load, and this to be a reaction. <laughs> and I'm fixing it because I know whatever I do, the moment there is zero, but I have to fix it to make it stable. Perfectly in order. Agreed. So that was a, a good problem. Now the challenge is draw the deflected shape for this. And wait, wait, will there be a relationship between this deflected shape and this deflected shape? What is common to this deflected shape and this deflected shape? What is common to them? Give me the correct answer. What is common to them? The, what is common to both of them? Bending moment diagram is same. So what is common? Curvature, Curvature is same. So that means this change in curvature with the radius of curvature changing, the same thing I can draw. Let's say I take this diagram and nowadays on computers we like to cut and paste and give movements, right? I take this, you remember in the, you know, as children we used to make bows and arrows and all that. Let's say this is a bow. This is a bow. Now, this answer is correct but I have to change the bow in such a way that some conditions this B it can move here the bow could not move at B at B it can move and at A slope should be zero that's all so I take this way I take this bow and rotate it about this point so that theta I rotate it give it a rigid body rotation of theta that's all I do and then it takes this shape. This is actually not very, yeah, it takes that shape. I just take this, put this as center and rotate this like a rigid body and it goes like that. If I draw the straight part, it will be like that. 
If I shade, the, actually if you shade it, it will come out nicely. If I shade this region, it will come out. That's it. Curvature is the same. Does it make sense? Then you can calculate your deflection. Okay. I think you learned a lot today. We'll stop here. It's 6.30. Thank you very much.